Hey guys, Christina here, and today I wanted to talk to you a bit about using Story of the World Volume 1 with older children, as well as using it for a second cycle. So we just completed using this volume for the second time. I have a review which I'll link up top if you want to see kind of how the program works and our thoughts on it and how we used it originally. At that time, I had children, I had a baby, a toddler, and I think children in grades one, two, and four. That was the first year that we homeschooled and that was one of the first curriculums that we used. Now, I had children in grades one, four, seven, and eight who used this curriculum. I have a child in grade 10 who used a different curriculum. So it was very different this time using it with older children. Also, I have since our homeschool style has developed and we do a lot of read alouds. So I wanted to share with you the read alouds that we did. First, I'm just gonna give you a really quick look at how I set our books up now because I've changed it a bit and I like this method so much more. So have a look at this. So since that original video, I have invested in a binding machine and I absolutely love it and highly recommend it. And I don't have the volume one book here because I actually didn't keep it because we have done two cycles and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But what I have found is that I would take the book apart and then spiral bind it. And I just love it so much better this way. I, am, I do have the plastic sheets, I just moved them because of the glare. And then I put the answer key to the test at the back as well as the map answer key. But I just found this so much more user-friendly than all the binding sheets or the page protectors that I'd used before. Now I did discover <laughs> after taking many of books apart, that they actually sell these books in PDF form through their website, um, <laughs> which I wish I had known a long time ago because I spent a lot of time taking these books apart. But The Well-Trained Mind does have that on their website. I think when this video comes out, it might be their big sale of the summer too. So that's really helpful. Plus you don't have to worry about making photocopies of the student pages if you're using them because you can just print them. So I just wanted to give you a quick look at that, that I much prefer the way that I have kept them now. It's more compact. I only have what I need and then getting the download, which I did for volume one just makes it so much easier. So then what I do for the kids is I do these little books. I found that doing the maps small and doing two per page, that it really works out just fine. They're still big enough to see everything, um, but it saves a lot of paper because Story of the World can take up a lot of paper. I do the same thing with the tests. I do them two to a page, and then I print them this way and I bind them. And I just have like a divider in between. It's just less paper, easier, and simpler, which I think is something I really have loved changing and getting more into as we homeschool, because when you homeschool five kids, you need simplicity. So I just wanted to give you a quick look at that kind of setup, because I highly recommend doing it this way, printing it yourself, not taking the books apart, um, but get a binder. It's, it's definitely worth it. So first, let me just address that my child who's in grade 10 did a different history. Because he's in high school, he has different goals he's working towards and he needed a more in-depth history. However, I still felt this program was very appropriate for my children in grades seven and eight. So they joined my younger children and that's why this is more kind of for older children this time around. Some things we didn't change. We still, of course, read the book. Although a number of years ago, I discovered that my local library had the CDs and so I would switch between listening to the audio and reading when I had to return them to the library. My current library does not have it, unfortunately, so I did buy the um, MP3s when they were on sale. So we listened to it this year instead of me reading because I was reading a lot with read alouds and it just helps save my voice. So that's one change we made, but we still listen to it. And then in the little book here, there's still all the different things. We still did the review questions. I would specifically ask children questions. The narration exercises, I tend just to actually read what they write here as a little summary to my children instead of having them narrate it back. 
And then we did the map. I did not have my child in grade one do the map, um, but he was still there. He was listening and he, he definitely took a lot and he answered questions, but I didn't feel he was old enough for the map. And then I had my older children do the quizzes. I always let my children, I asked them to go through the quiz once and then they're welcome to take the book to look up the answers to the quiz because I don't want them just to get it wrong and to uh, like be told the answer. I want them to find the answer themselves. I feel like they're gonna remember things better that way. So I would let them do that. And that's kind of what we did with the book itself. When you look at the book here, there's extra additional history reading and corresponding literature suggestions for each chapter. I still took out a lot of library books. I would go a couple weeks in advance to my library website and put a bunch on hold and just kind of strew them around, get them out. I had a few that I required my children to do as independent reads. Um, I think I'm just gonna link them in the comment section down below or that little info section. So you can take a look there if you want to see the read, independent reads that I had them do. But then I took from this resource, as well as Sunlight, Bookshark, uh, The Good and the Beautiful History, and I, I kind of went through all these resources and found books that I felt like would work with certain chapters. One thing I did differently this year is we did not do as many read-alouds. I tried to tone it back a bit. Um, but we still did quite a few. So I'm gonna go ahead and share those with you in the order that we did them, and I will insert pictures for you. So the first one was Discovery in the Cave by Mark Dabowski. My kids, I asked them every time we were done reading what they would give the book out of five, and I kind of took a general consensus, and they gave this book a four. The next one was Before Adam by Jack London. This was a really interesting book. My children gave it a four out of five. If you want to only focus on Christian-based history, I wouldn't recommend this book, um, and I would recommend it for older children, definitely, but it was, it was interesting, so keep that in mind. All right, the next one was Maru of the Winter Caves by Anne Tur Turnbull. We gave it a four out of five. My daughter, grade four, particularly really liked it and she went back and read it again on her own. We did Boy of the Pyramids by Ruth Fosdick Jones and that one got a four out of five. If I recall, that was quite a short read. Then Golden Bull, a Mesopotamian adventure by Marjorie Cowley and we gave this one a four out of five. Then we listened on Audible to The Cat of Bubastis by G.A. Henty, and we gave it a four. We like a number of Henty's books. This one was a little tough to get through. It was repetitive, so definitely for the more older children, it's a little hard to listen to. The next one was Egyptian Diary, The Journal of Nocket by Richard Platt. We gave this a two out of five. It was not our favorite book. Then A Cry from Egypt by Hope Ayer, Ayer, and we gave that a four out of five. Next was Adara by Beatrice Gormley, and that one we also gave a four out of five. Then we listened to The Children's Homer by Padraig Colum. We gave it a three out of five. One thing I think is important that I've learned and hopefully can share with you is you don't have to read books when there's an audio version. It's okay to listen to the audio version, particularly when the words and the names are hard. I really appreciate Audible or just any like audio version of it because sometimes, especially in this time period, the names can be mighty hard and it's nice to just listen to it sometimes. So then the next one was a very short one, King Midas by Kathleen Olmsted. We gave it a five out of five. Everyone loved it. Of course, very short and engaging, definitely for a younger child. Then The Golden Goblet by Eloise Jarvis McGraw. That one we gave a three out of five. Next was The Bronze Bow by Elizabeth George Spear. We gave it a three out of five. Mystery of the Roman Ransom by Henry Winterfield. We gave three out of five. Slave Boy of Judea by Josephine Sanger Lau. 
I gave this one a four to five, it was pretty good. And then The Sign of the Anchor by Evelyn C. Nevin. I gave this one a four out of five. It was an interesting book. Um, so those are the ones we read. There were a couple others I had scheduled. There was two that we started, we never finished. Um, I just knew that they weren't gonna work right away. And I think I had one other or two other on the schedule that we didn't do, plus one audiobook that we didn't do. So that's something that's changed a little bit. It's definitely more, uh, I have a more open mind when it comes to not finishing things or changing things up. I'm more flexible than I used to be. And I think that's important, especially with older children. They're sick, there's activities, you know, life happens. So that's what we did. So I'll list the independent reads down below for you. So the other thing that we did was art. Now when the children were younger, we did art like almost every chapter, I think we did something, or at least every other one. That really changed with older children. I planned to do six art projects and we ended up only doing two. That's it. I found a number of years ago that doing art as a family in the evening, like a Friday or a Saturday, was really the best option for our family. When the kids were younger, I had my husband an extra set of hands to help, but I just, it just feels better, it works better, we all do it together, we talk. So we only did two art projects, which maybe that's just because the children are older and timing. Um, a little sad we didn't do more, but the two that we did, we really enjoyed doing together. Now, one of the things I mentioned last time I did Story of the World was that I felt like the maps were kind of too closed in. We couldn't really, like you needed to have a map of the whole world and know what part of the world you're talking about. So this year we actually did Understanding Western Asia by the Great World Adventure while we were doing Story of the World Volume 1. I have an entire review on this that again, I'll link up top somewhere. It's geared for 12 and up, but it works for a little bit younger children. I'm not gonna go over it too much because like I said, I have that review, but it really, I found it super helpful to have that information on the history but also the current of the location we are talking about. I just found it really helped to bring everything together to get a better understanding of cultures and traditions and kind of how they started and how they have continued in some ways. So I highly recommend if you have older children checking that out and doing it together with Story of the World, the volume one. I just found it, it was really helpful. Highly recommend this. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. That's kind of our experience doing Story of the World both a second time and with older children. If you have done Story of the World a second time or with older children, leave in the comment section down below kind of changes or adjustments that you made. Or if you have any questions for me, you can always leave them down there as well. Otherwise though, I hope this has been informative and helpful and I hope this finds you having a great day. Take care.